the word of the Lord is keep your head up. Keep your head up. Turn to someone next to you and say, keep your head up. If you got a Bible, go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We live in a time right now where there's an attack on the head. And there's an attack on the thoughts that we think and whether or not we're using our head or keeping our head. And in fact, during quarantine, during COVID-19, it seemed like every morning uh, that I woke up, I was trying to figure out what day it was, what was going on, was it just a dream? How many of y'all felt a little foggy during those 13 weeks? And, and even right now, you're still like, I don't know, is it Sunday? What's happening right now? And so Paul says to Timothy, he says, there will be people who do not want to hear the truth. They will turn away from truth and they'll turn aside to myths. But you, everybody say, but you. He says, keep your head. Everybody say, keep your head. Before I get to the word up, I want to just focus on those three words. Keep your head. Keep, we are living in a society, the age of outrage is literally throwing the head out the window and just giving full vent to our emotions and our feelings. And when you are not living with your head, when you're not keeping your head, you are not walking in wisdom. <laughs> God did not call us to live completely addicted to our emotions and our feelings. Uh, when you throw, when you're not using your head, you are forfeiting opportunities that God has for you. When you're not keeping your head focused, you're getting angry, you're getting impatient, you're getting frustrated. This is a season for fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, uh, whatever race you are, whatever tribe you are, keep your head. Don't lose your head. Paul says, Timothy, keep your head in every situation. Don't lose the ability to think. There's an attack on your thoughts. There's an attack on your head. Keep your head, endure hardship, do the work, discharge the duties of your ministry. And then he says this, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure has come. So this is Paul's final letter. Second Timothy is the last thing he writes before he's martyred for his faith. He says, I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness. There's a reward that will go on the head of those who keep their heads in the midst of all circumstances and situations. You know, I think about how we're in this series right now, kind of thinking about end times, what the Bible has to say about end times. We truly are living in a season that I think is getting closer and closer to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Revelation chapter four, John was on the island of Patmos. He was writing this book called Revelation, and he was surrounded by adversity. Here he is. He's in exile. They tried to kill John. He was in his 90s. He had been, uh, they had attempted to torture him, kill him. They threw him in a boiling pot of oil. They thought that would kill him. He came out of the boiling pot of oil and he didn't die. And then they sent him to an island called Patmos. Now this would have been like an island off of Greece that's very pretty, very beautiful, except for he was all by himself. He didn't have food and uh, he had to find a way to survive on the island. So here he is, he's living on this island. He's, he's all by himself, adversity all around him probably some wild animals out there. And in that moment, John has a revelation. And he writes this revelation and calls it revelation. And in Revelation chapter four, verse one, he says, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice that I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, come up here, come up here. Get your head out of what's going on down there and look up at what I'm doing up here. If we are so fixed and focused on what's going on around us, then we're of course going to be triggered by what's going on around us. But if we can lift our head above the circumstances, if we can lift our head above the adversity, above the screaming babies, above the dirty diapers, above the unrest in the streets of America, above the political divisiveness that spews from CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, above all of the agendas that are right in front of our face, come up here. Keep your head up, church. This is not a time to be staring sideways, downwards, every little news thing that you see. Somebody say, keep your head up. Keep your head up. As John lifted his head, all of a sudden he has a revelation of a, of a future of what God is about to do, that the best days are truly right in front of him. 
John, in the middle of adversity, gets a revelation of God's prosperity, gets a revelation of God's presence, God's power, God's purpose, God's praise. John doesn't get fixed on his problems. He gets fixed on a revelation of what God is about to do in the midst of his adversity. And you know what? John lives past that island. He didn't die on that island. People thought he would die while he was on Patmos. In fact, he actually got to leave the island and go back, and he never died a martyr's death. He was able to die as an old man in his late 90s working for the church. How did he survive the island? How did he survive the adversity? How did he survive the obscurity? How did he survive the loneliness? He kept his head up. How are you going to survive the season we're in right now? You're going to keep your head up. Because if you don't, you're going to miss out on a revelation that God has for you. This last week, my wife and I, we, we discovered we had bees that had gotten into our house. And there was literally hundreds of bumblebees that were flying around our house. And they were going into our kids' rooms. They were flying above our kids' heads. We were freaking out, trying to call. Who do we call when you got bumblebees? Apparently, there's a bunch of beekeepers in Oklahoma. So we started calling through the list. I can't make it. I can't do it. No, I'm not able to come. And finally, we got a hold of this one guy, and he says, yeah, I can come. We were like, praise God. He goes, yeah, just give me three days. And I'm like, we're like watching bumblebees all around our house. I'm like, we don't have three days. We may not make it in three days. We need your help right now. There are tons of bees. We don't know how they got in. So he shows up. And he's got this vacuum. He goes, we don't want to kill the bees. We want to save the bees because the world needs the bees. I was like, all right, fine. Just get the bees out of my bees nest right now. <laughs> and so he gets his vacuum. He starts sucking these bees out. And he discovers that they had gotten into a soffit in our house right outside. And inside the soffit, they had come in and they had created a massive hive. Like tons and ton thousands of bees were in our attic flying right above our heads. I'm preaching about the head this morning. And there's a reason why I'm talking about this story. It's because oftentimes we're so consumed with what's going on right here, we are not aware that there is a battle for the mind that's going on right above our heads. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, this war we're in is not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers that are in the heavenly spaces, that are in the air right above our heads. Church, I'm telling you, we are in a battle going on right now over your head. The problems that you're facing right now are going to be won in the mindset. There's not a battle over your feet. There's not a battle over your, your shoulders. There's not a battle over your hands. Liam, there's a battle over your head. Shh. There's a battle over your head. There's a battle going on over my head, listening to him talk right now. <laughs> the battle is in the, is in the mind. I'm serious. Like when Paul starts going through the list of weapons and the list of, of warfare that we have, all of it is to demolish strongholds in the mindset. He doesn't say these weapons are for you to handle out here. These are weapons for you to destroy arguments with your spouse. These are weapons to take control over your thought life. He goes through a list of armor. He says, you gotta get your shoes on, you gotta get your belt of truth on, you gotta get the breastplate of righteousness, make sure you have the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. And then there's one piece that oftentimes is overlooked and it's the helmet of salvation. Because the covering over the head might be the most important piece of equipment we wear as Christians. We're in a season right now where I'm telling you the world is literally just losing their minds. And I'm going, is anybody thinking right now? Proverbs says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, where your, where your head goes, your body goes. There's a reason why Paul in Ephesians 5 says the husband is the head of the household, just as Christ is the head of the church. Did you know that Lucifer in the Bible, Satan, his great, like his biggest threat was Jesus. From the very beginning of the Bible, if Jesus showed up on the earth, his game over, Satan was going to lose. So what does he do? He creates a genocide starting in, um, uh, in Exodus, and the genocide is, com is completely connected to the Hebrew children because he knew that the Messiah would come through the Hebrew children. So he tries to get this genocide that would take out Moses. He couldn't take out Moses. Moses walks the earth. Moses does amazing things. From Moses comes Joshua and all the tribes of Israel. And then through that, David. And then through David's lineage, Joseph, who's married to Mary. When Mary is pregnant with Jesus, she's carrying the head of the church. 
But did you know that there was another genocide that tried to come to stop that head? If you can stop the head, you can stop the church. If you can, if you can, you take out the head, you take out the family. This is why we're seeing an attack right now on men. We're seeing an attack on masculinity. We're seeing an attack on on just the whole gender confusion problem in America and in the world right now. The enemy does not want the head to understand who he is and what his authority is and what he's called to do. But it's not just for men. I'm speaking now to the head of every person in this room. All of you have a head. (laughs) The question is, is your head protected? Are you keeping your head covered? Are you wearing the helmet of salvation? Are you taking captive of the thoughts that are trying to distort, confuse, and fog up your brain from understanding what the will of God is in this hour? There's an attack on the head. So the beekeeper, he starts sucking out all these bees and he brings out the hive and he says, I got all the bees out and I have a hive for you. I said, what am I gonna do with the hive? And he said, well, it's good for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, if you eat the hive, if you eat the honeycomb, it actually makes your immune system healthier and it makes you immune to allergies. He's like, do you have allergies? I was like, yes. Oklahoma gets rough in April and in May and the pollen in the air. My eyes start getting wild. I got to get Zyrtec times 20. I got to get, you know, Allegra. I got to get all the medicine. How many of y'all have allergies at times? All right. So, so, you know, he starts explaining. He goes, if you will eat this hive, This will actually make you stronger. Your immune system will be stronger. And so I said, so you're telling me the thing that was sent to attack me, the thing that was sent to mess with my family, the thing that was messing with my kids and messing with me, the thing that was messing with my head is actually sent to bless me. He said, I'm telling you the thing that was sent to destroy you, the thing that was going to eat you, if you eat it, you will experience strength. I'm telling you right now, come on, I'm preaching to you, church. What I'm saying is you got to start finding the honey in your bees. When I started eating that hive, it was dripping with honey. I've got a picture of it, and um, it is dripping with this just tons of honey. Now, it looks kind of gross, but that's like dark honey, local honey. That's the best honey you can eat. As I started eating it, man, I felt stronger. I was like Samson just eating the hive. I was like, whoa. I'm like ready to be a bee. I am bee man. I'm going to sting like a bee. I'm about to fly in this space right here. Y'all don't know who you're looking at. I got a, there's a bee inside of me. (laughs) What am I saying? When John was on the island of Patmos, he had to find a revelation in the midst of his adversity. He had to find the honey in the midst of the thing that was trying to destroy him. Right now, some of you are walking through attacks. You're walking through things that are messing with you. And God says, if you will get your head up, you will see that the very thing that was meant to destroy you is going to be the place that I give you the greatest revelation of my purpose, my praise, my power, my presence, what I'm about to do. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. John gets a revelation of God's presence in the midst of his adversity. But you got to get your head up. You got to get your head up. Where's your head right now? Where's your head? Second Corinthians 10, Paul says these weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are heavenly. And these weapons are given to us to cast down imaginations. When I was playing basketball as a kid, the other team, they knew if they could get in my head, they could mess with my game. They, 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 like there would be a guy oftentimes when we played Metro, Metro Christian Academy, Victory Christian School versus Metro. And there would be this one guy. We were rivals and he would always mess with me. He would just say things. He would just, you know, like just talk trash talk because he knew if he could get in my head, he could cause me to not focus and make my free throws. If he could get in my head, he could cause me to to not be focusing on the plays that our team was running. The enemy knows if he can get in your head. He can distract you from your purpose. He can mess with your assignment. So Paul says, these weapons we have are meant for us to cast down imaginations, that we demolish every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. When you have your head up, you know the truth. You're able to separate feelings from facts. You're able to understand what God has called you to do. When you've got your head up, you're taking captive of every thought that's not of God. Like when my father passed away, depression tried to seep into my life. It tried to seep into my life. Uh, Discouragement, despair. What's going to happen with the church? Worry, stress. Uh, when, When there was a season where I got really like just impatient um, and, and, and I could just feel myself 
just needing a break. I just needed to take a Sabbath. I needed to rest. But I kept pushing myself, pushing myself, pushing myself. And sometimes we do that. We just get so good at working, 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 busy, busy, busy. And we're not using our head. And we're not using time to really rest or process or think through things. And then we build up and then unintentionally we explode. And again, we're seeing this in the world right now. People just exploding with anger, exploding with hostility, offended at anything you say. Anything you say or if you say it the wrong way, there's an explosion. We've got to learn to take captive of every thought that's not of God. we got to get our heads back. You will never win a battle if you let your feelings govern your behavior. You've got to get your mind back into the fight. If you're going to fight an enemy that has knowledge, you cannot fight him with feelings. You have to fight him with facts. Our enemy is not stupid, and he's not a feeling-based enemy. He's a fact-based enemy. And what he does is he will twist facts. He will speak lies because he knows if I can lie, if I can create shadows and ghosts and imaginations so that they're suspicious about everything, and they keep yelling at their spouse for 15 years, just screaming, and, and nothing changes, but we just keep on practicing the same hostility towards our family. We keep on walking in the same assumptions towards people. We keep living with the same insecurities, watching other people get blessed, not being able to celebrate them. This is what happened with Cain in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain was getting jealous as his brother Abel was experiencing a blessing. And Cain's jealousy, his feelings took over. He was no longer thinking. He was no longer u- using any wisdom. By the way, wisdom is a gift from God. How many of y'all believe we need more wisdom in our leadership from the very top of this nation all the way down? We need wisdom. We need godly wisdom, not just opinions. We need wisdom. All right, so Cain gets out of wisdom and gets into his feelings, and there's a secular song out called In My Feelings. We need to get up out of our feelings and tap into the mindset of Christ. But Cain is in his feelings. He's anger. He's jealousy. He's downcast. He's discouraged, and God shows up in verse 5. And God says, Cain, what's going on? Verse 6, Genesis 4, verse 6, the Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? Why have you given into these feelings of rage? Why is your face downcast? Why are you depressed? This is my question for you today. Why is your head down? Why is your head sideways? Why is your head foggy? Why is your head confused right now? You say, well, Paul, there's just a lot of things going on out there. And Listen, Paul, I'm, I mean... I don't know if you checked your phone lately, but look, do you see the new stuff? I mean, you're asking me why my head's foggy and confused. Dude, are you watching? Did you see what happened in Tulsa last night? Are you watching the news? Do you see what's going on? This is the problem. We're looking everywhere except for up. Why is your head sideways? Is that working for you? Is sideways working for you? Is downwards working for you? Well, I just can't help it. I was raised with a downwards head. I was, I was raised with depression. I was raised with discouragement. Well, you can re-raise yourself starting today. You can tap into the glory and the lifter of your head. Just because you grew up in a family that discouraged you and put you down and bullied you doesn't mean you got to stay that way. You can break the generational curse in your family. Get your head up, man. Get your head up, father. Get your head up, son. Get your head up, daughter. You cannot win with your head down. You cannot win the battle that's going on over your mindset right now if you don't get your head up. Number one, I want to give you four things. When you get your head up, you get a revelation of God's purpose. When John got his head up, he got a revelation of God's purpose. When Cain's head was down, God said, Cain, why are you discouraged? Why are you downcast? Why is your head down? Cain said, because you're blessing my brother, but you're not blessing me. This, this was something that I grew up as, as a child of uh, four, four kids. So I was a brother, of, uh, I had an older brother, two older sisters. And there was always this competition. I'm seeing this now with our kids. That at any time one of the other siblings gets some more attention from the parents, one of the other siblings is like, why aren't you paying attention to me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> this would happen sometimes where my dad would go into my brother's room and he would pray with them and he would tell them a story. And I would just like be having my Eeyore pity party, just peering out my door and I'd be like, nobody's coming to my room. Nobody loves me. Nobody invited me to their birthday party. It's always raining in Paul's room. It's always thunder and lightning. Just having a pity party. And my dad would come in the room and I'd be like, don't worry about it. Just gonna tuck myself in tonight. 
And my dad would be like, what's wrong? He'd be like, you spent more time with John than you did with me. Like, if you think about the story of Cain and Abel, it's just pure brother jealousy. And my dad had to train me, like I'm training my kids right now. Get your head up out of the... <laughs> jealousy and division and, and, <laughs> and envy and assumptions and suspicions. And I'm glad he taught me that. Because if you don't teach a six-year-old that, one day he turns 45. One day she turns 36 and she's just looking as other girls walk in the room and her insecurities keep her head down. She's skinnier than me. She's got more blessings than me. He's got more opportunities. He, he drives a nicer car. He lives in a bigger house. And so we're looking down and we're looking sideways and we're discouraged and we're insecure and we can't celebrate someone else in the same city that we live in who's getting blessed. Like I'm happy. I am happy when other brothers get blessed in our city because they should be blessed. They're children of God. If I'm unhappy, that's not their problem. That's my problem. I'm still living as a six-year-old kid who doesn't know how to keep his head above his own jealousy. When we have problems in our families and problems in our households and problems at work, most of the time it's because our head is down or sideways. You gotta get your head back up. So God speaks to Cain in Genesis four, verse seven. He says, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, if you give into your feelings, if you become a feeling-based leader, if you became a feeling-based father, if you become a feeling-based mother, if you become a feeling-based son, a feeling-based daughter, sin is crouching at the door of your feelings. And so Cain would spend the rest of his life running from the law because one moment of giving into your feelings can cost you. The ultimate act of a feeling-based person is murder, suicide or murder. I just don't feel hopeful anymore. I just don't feel happy anymore. I just, he's not making me happy, so I'm leaving the marriage. She's not making me feel honored, so I'm leaving. They don't honor me, so I'm leaving. And I'm, I'm, I'm feeling frustrated, and so because I'm feeling this way, I just, I don't even deserve to live. And I, because I'm feeling this way, I'm going to attack him because I deserve the revenge. And when you live with those feelings, you throw your mind out the window. The battle for greater, the battle for the blessing on your life is going to be fought in the mind. And when you get your head up, you get out of your feelings and you get focused on God's purpose. Oh God, I pray that we would get our heads out of our own agendas, our own opinions, our own feelings, and we would get our heads focused on the truth in God's word. When John lifted his head up, all of a sudden, God starts giving John a purpose. When Nehemiah was feeling overwhelmed because he heard that Israel was burned down and he heard that Israel was in ashes, it was in ruins. Nehemiah cries, that's good. Allow yourself to express your feelings. But then he doesn't stay in the grief. Nehemiah prays. What does prayer do? It lifts your head above your problems. And he says, God, what should I do? And God says, Nehemiah, you're the solution. So go and be a part of it. So Nehemiah goes to a secular king who has really no Christian values, <laughs> says things he shouldn't say, does things he shouldn't do. And he says to the king, I need to go and help Israel because there's problems there. The king says, all right, well, I want to help you with that. I will pay you while you're gone. I'll give you resources and money. He shouldn't accept that. That's a secular king. He's not asking for the king to be his pastor. He's just asking for the king to bless his work. This is where you got to separate feelings from facts. Our world wants us to disassociate with anyone that they don't like. So we have cancel culture. But cancel culture is not kingdom culture. When you're tapping into God's purpose, you can work with the right and with the left because you're not in one ditch or the other. You're in the kingdom of God. So I'm not working with the donkeys or the elephants. I'm working right in the, I'm, I'm carrying the cross. What brings us together is not what political party we're connected to, but because we are part of a kingdom that is not of this world. So I'm not riding on a donkey or an elephant. I'm walking with a cross. And when I'm walking with a cross, I can pull in different people and say, hey, I need your help. We've got to be a part of bringing healing to our city. And we're building a swimming pool. And we need the Methodist involved. We need the Baptist involved. We need transformation involved. We need church on the move involved. We need the Unitarian church involved. I want the Muslims. Listen, we've got to stop drawing all these lines saying we can't work with other people. It's got to stay right here in victory. 
I know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But I also know that he placed me in the world to be a light. And if I'm in the world to be a light, how can I be a light if I close all the doors and I say no one's allowed into our church, no one's allowed to be a part of what we're doing at the Dream Center unless they believe, think, and feel the exact same way as us? No. The Dream Center is about to do something we've never done before. In fact, this last week we got contacted by the White House. And they said, we'd like to come and see the Dream Center in, in Tulsa. And so we kept it on the, on the down low. But yesterday, Vice President Pence allowed me and Pastor AJ to give him a tour at the Tulsa Dream Center. He came in and he just said, what can the government do to bring healing to this city? And so we gave him a list. And we told him there's a swimming pool, there's a splash pad. Governor Stitt was there, Senator Lankford. And we said, listen, we're not here to have a political conversation. We're here to invite you to be a part of healing our nation. And if you want to do that, here's some things that we can all be a part of. Man, he sat there with humility. He allowed us to pray for him. Governor Stitt allowed us to pray for him. And I can already feel people in the room, or maybe online, because in the age of feeling-based society, we're all up in our feelings. Well, I just don't feel like he should do that. You don't have a seat at the table when you allow your feelings to govern you. The only way to sit at the table is to get the mind of Christ. To say, if I'm going to partner, not political partnership, I'm saying, so now we've got Ben Carson and HUD reaching out to us saying, we're going to open up the lines to allow the Dream Center to operate the housing places in North Tulsa. What I'm saying is, my goodness. You cannot fight with feelings. I'm telling you, the best days for the church and the Dream Center and Tulsa. So we said, listen, next year is the 100 year anniversary of the race riots that happened, the race massacre that happened. And we want we want as many people in our nation to be a part of helping bring healing to our city as possible. Because we're a church. And a church doesn't cancel people. A church invites people. From all different political backgrounds. If it was President Obama, I would invite him. If it was Hillary Clinton, I would invite her. Well, I don't know if we can work with all these different people. The kingdom of God is about inviting people to be a part of whatever God is doing. We gotta stop killing each other. We gotta stop killing each other. We gotta stop shooting friendly fire all the time. We gotta get our head above the noise down here. Like our, this is exactly, we are playing, our world is playing into the enemy's agenda. The enemy wants us in a feeling fight so that we don't learn how to use our heads. So we're running around like chickens with our heads cut off, just flapping and fighting and not knowing what to do. And, and while that's happening, agendas and laws are being passed and conversations are happening in quiet private rooms where the real change actually happens. It doesn't happen in the noise. It happens in those closed doors. And yesterday, I witnessed a miracle as all of a sudden government officials who would never come to a place like the Tulsa Dream Center came in humility and said, we are sorry for what has happened. We are sorry for anything that, that, has, that has affected this nation, and we want to be a part of bringing healing. And there was such a powerful, heavenly conversation of healing that was happening in the room. With police officials, too, it was powerful. When you get your head up, you tap into God's purpose. Number two, you tap into God's presence. You get a revelation of God's presence. Man, we need that. We need a revelation that the presence of God is with us wherever we go. David said in Psalm 139, whether I make my bed in hell, you're there. Whether I ride on the wings of eagles, you're there. Whether I'm changing dirty diapers, you're right there. Whether I'm stepping on my kids' Legos in the middle of the night, you're right there. <laughs> Whatever season you're in, the presence of God is there. We need a revelation of the presence of God. The presence of God is something that I can't live without. In fact, I think it's what should mark our church. When people come, I want them to say, man, there's just a, there's just a true presence of God at Victory Church services. 
It's here. He's in the room. His presence is here. His love is here. When John was on the island of Patmos writing the book of Revelation, he was all by himself, but he wasn't all by himself because he had a revelation of the presence of God. So he wasn't lonely. For anyone in the room today who feels lonely or discouraged or afflicted or just confused, the presence of God is here to touch your mind, to help you in the middle of your thoughts, in the middle of your confusion, your anxiety, your depression, your discouragement. It's here. Number three, and I want the keys to come out. Number three, you get a revelation of God's power. When you get your head up, you get a revelation of the power of God. John saw this in Revelation. He said, behold, I saw God's power coming from the throne like peals of thunder, lightning. And then this power moved through the nations. And again, we're in this end time series, and I keep thinking the power of God, for some of us, we've condensed the power of God that it's only when a physical miracle happens. So when someone who wasn't supposed to get pregnant gets pregnant, we say, man, that was an act of God. That was the power of God. When someone who was blind all of a sudden starts to see, we say, wow, that was the power of God. Deaf ears get open. Wow, that's the power of God. That is one small slice of the power of God. But another huge part of the power of God is when a family is walking in wholeness, when a husband and wife are walking in unity, when there's no strife in the home. Wow, the power of God is all over that house. When a single parent mom is raising her kids and she's able to just help her kids. He's able to help his kids and, and there's favor and everything they do, she begins to prosper in her workplace. She begins to be promoted and then she's able to pour into her kids, getting them in church and, and things begin to flow with peace and unity in the house and there's hope and there's love and there's no harmful words towards the ex or towards the stepfather or the stepmother. There's just peace. You go, well, I don't know if that's, the, no, 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 that's the power of God that's just breaking down barriers in people's lives. That's the power of God when Paul the Apostle planted churches that begin to change communities, even when there was no physical manifestation of a healing, but yet the community began to change. It started getting better. In North Tulsa, I see the power of God for 20 years feeding families. This last 13 weeks, 1.7 million meals given away. That's the power of God. When you get your head up, you tap into a greater level of that power. You start doing things you've never done before. You start walking in authority you've never walked in before. As a church, when we started doing our drive-in services, the only way we were able to do that is by getting our heads up, because no one else was doing it when we started. And all I could hear was just confusion, frustration. When you watch CNN <laughs> or Fox News or MSNBC or NBC or ABC or all the C's, all the stuff out there, you get confused, because they're all speaking their own agenda. So one shows a picture of this room that looks like their perspective, and the other one shows a picture of this room that looks like their perspective. I'm kind of tired of looking at everyone else's agenda except for looking at his. So I'm going to get my head up, and I'm going to stop looking over here at all these news stations, and I'm just going to say, God, what do you want to do? Because when you get your head up, you tap into God's power, and God says, I want you to do a drive-in service. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to give this car away. I want you to help this single-parent family. I want you to do this. But God, people are going to think I'm doing it just to be seen. No, no, no. Don't worry about what people think. That's sidewards looking. You got to get your head up. Don't worry about what people think about you praying for the vice. You got to get your head up. Don't worry about people who will hate you and reject you and say all kinds of evil things about you. Just get your head up. David said in Psalm 3, verse 3, that my God is the glory and the lifter of my head. David needed that because he had made mistakes as a dad. He had committed adultery. He didn't do the best job on one of his kids. And that one kid, Absalom, just got into a mess of trouble and tried to kill his own dad. There was drama in David's family. David had a lot of reasons to be discouraged. He could have been that one dad just carrying regrets around. Oh, I wish I woulda. If I just coulda. I shoulda. I woulda, coulda, shoulda done these things as a dad. But instead, David said, I'm going to shake it off and I'm gonna lift my head up. I can't change my past, so I gotta get my head out of my past. I gotta get my head out of the problems and the mistakes I've made. I gotta get my head off the rear view mirror. I've gotta stop looking at behind me. I gotta start looking at what's right in front of me, that God's not finished with my story yet.
God's not finished with my testimony yet. Number four, when you get your head up, you get a revelation of God's praise. So again, when you read the book of Revelation, it's a praise service. It's just a bunch of praise and worship songs happening in the midst of all of this stuff that's going on. John said, behold, I saw the throne. And around the throne was living creatures. And they would all begin to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is his name. Great and marvelous are your deeds. Just and true are your ways. King of the nations. And then they would begin to sing. They would begin to worship. You are just in your judgments. Oh, holy one. Yes, Lord Almighty. True and just are you. Hallelujah, they would sing. Praise be to the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord. We used to sing this song when I was a kid. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of our salvation. Come on, church. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of our salvation. When we begin to magnify the Lord, when we begin to lift up his name, it gets our eyes and our minds off of our problems. We begin to get our minds fixed on his praise. Your praise will ever be on my lips. When I begin to praise, I begin to see a different perspective of my problems. I'm no longer looking at my problems from an earthly vantage point. I begin to see it from a heavenly vantage point. My dad had a story he used to tell in church. And I want to end today's sermon with this story. In fact, I kind of want to tag team preach to finish this sermon. So I'm going to let him. It's like one minute long, but hold your horses. This is, in my opinion, the best part of the message. My dad has a story to tell about his father that has to do with understanding. All of us in this, in this room, all of us have a race to run. And you can't run this race if your head's not lifted up. Check this out. When I was a young boy, I was running track, and my dad was up in the stands yelling. When the gun sounded and started off, I went around that first curve down the stretch, and I was coming around the back stretch, and I heard this voice yelling, Come on, Billy Joe, come on! Only it wasn't from a distance. It was close. He was at hand. He's running just right beside the track. Come on, Billy Joe, come on, come on. I don't know who won, him or me, but it's always caused me to think about later on how Jesus Christ came out of the grandstands of heaven and got in the race of life, not just to cheer us from up there. He came to show us what it was like Hallelujah. He's in the race with you saying, come on. He's going to be inside of you, helping you, strengthening you. Lord, we praise you that you're in this race with us every day, not just cheering for us from heaven, but by salvation you've come to live in our heart. are here. St. Iru. That's my mama. Hallelujah. St. Sharon. St. Billy Joe. Has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? I love that video. I watch it every now and then. 
But what I love about it is so many things. One, this song says, I'll keep my eyes on you. I'll run my race and I'll keep my eyes on you. You can't keep your eyes on God down here. You can't keep your eyes on God looking at what everyone else is saying, what everyone else is doing. Or even right here, just watching the TV, trying to figure out. <laughs> so many of us are right here. And God's saying, look up, Dad. Look up, Dad. Look up, Dad. Look up, Mom. Look up, son. Look up, daughter. Well, I'm distracted right now. I've got, I, mean, I get, there's a lot of stuff going on in the news right now. I got, I got, I got all these, yeah, I got stuff that I got to do. And God's saying, if you just had your head up, man, you'd see so much more clearly what's going on in this world. If you just had your head up, you could finish the race that you're exhausted to run right now. If you just had your head up, you'd have so much more strength in the battle that you want to just throw in the towel of it right now. Whatever the relationship battle is, whatever the situation is, keep your head up. My dad used to always say that to me. Polly, get your head up. After I would lose a game, get your head up, get your head up. What does that mean, dad? It means get your head up. It means stop being so defeated and discouraged. It means stop being so feeling based. Get your head up. Get a hold of your thoughts again. Get your head back. Stop letting the enemy have such a stronghold on your thoughts, a stronghold on the way that you think. I want us to stand to our feet this morning because I believe that as we praise, breakthrough begins to happen in mindsets. I believe when we get our heads up, John said, oh, magnify the Lord. Oh, zoom in on the thing that really matters. Get your eyes off of Patmos. Get your eyes off of the problem. Get your eyes off the adversity and get your eyes on the throne. He's still on the throne. He's not left the throne. He's still a good God. He's still a faithful God. He's still the same God that he was 20 years ago when you felt his presence. It's just that you got to get your head up. You got to get your head up out of your past. You got to get your head up out of the fear that's trying to mess with you. You got to get your head up out of the anger that you've given into. You got to get your head up out of the depression that you've been walking in. You got to get your head up out of the shame and guilt and regrets that you've been holding on to. You got to get your head up. Get your head up in his mercy. Get your head up in his grace. Get your head up in his forgiveness. Get your head up in his hope that the best days are truly still in front of you, that he's not finished with you yet. Somebody said, get your head up. Get your head up. Get your head up, son. Get your head up, daughter. Get your head up. I know you feel frustrated. I just want you to close your eyes. I'm speaking to someone right now. And I sense in my spirit as I'm, I'm just praying over this room right now, even as I'm preaching, that there's people in the room, you've gotten your heart broken a little bit. You've gotten your mind messed with. There's been some confusion, some foggy, fogginess that's been messing with your thoughts. Maybe even jealousy, maybe even just not knowing what's next. Not knowing how to handle the future. Waking up every day, trying to figure out what day it is. Not even wanting to get out of bed. Just battling that desire to keep going. And I want to pray for every mind in the room. Every head. All of you in this room have a head. All of us have a head. Everyone watching online. And I, I just sense the enemy is trying to mess with your head. He's trying to just... And you got to get your helmet back on. You got to get your mindset right back on God. You got to get your head back up. Your eyes back up on the Lord. If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand. If you just need prayer for your head right now, your mind, you've just been having to battle some thoughts, some things that have been messing with your mind. Imaginations, thoughts, suspicion, assumption, fear, regrets, shame, woulda, coulda, shoulda things about this year. Maybe even fear about the future, fear of the unknown, fear of man, fear of what people think about you, fear of saying something and then being a, rejected by people, not knowing what to say. Lord, I just pray for every mind in the room. Just lift your hands up. David said, you anoint my head with oil. The anointing on that head would flow to his cup. He said, my cup runneth over. The cup doesn't run over if the head doesn't get anointed. To get the head anointed, that flow begins to come down. It comes from your thoughts. To say, Lord, you anoint my head with oil. Lord, I pray for every head in the room, every mind. God, I pray for every person, the season that they're in. God, that you would pour out an oil of gladness, joy, healthy, positive perspective on the situation they're walking through. God, I pray, Lord, that they would see it from your vantage point. That they would be in tune with your spirit. That they would know how to discern feelings from facts. That they would know how to discern 
truth from deception. God, that their head would be fixed on your purpose, your assignment for them in this season. And they would walk with authority, that they would not walk in insecurity, that they would not walk in inferiority, but they would walk in authority as a child of God. They would know whose they are. They would know who they are. And God, they would begin to operate out of that identity. And I pray right now, God, that depression has to go. Fear has to go. Shame has to go. Shame off of you in Jesus' name. Fogginess has to leave you. Confusion has to go. Clarity is coming back to your brain. You're getting your head back. You're getting your mind back in Jesus' name. I pray, God, for every man in the room, every woman in the room, God, that they would have a clear mind, the mind of Christ on every decision they have to make, every situation they're in, every circumstance they're facing, that they would have the mind of Christ. And it's unclogged and it's unfogged in Jesus' name. Just say this with me, Jesus, thank you for giving me the mind of Christ. I put on the helmet of salvation. I'm gonna guard my thoughts. I'm gonna keep my eyes on you. I'm gonna keep my head up. You are the lifter of my head. I repent of sin and I receive your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. And I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I'm all yours, God. And I'm going to keep my head up. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you, Victory. God bless you. Have a great week.